speaker. Okay, because it says uh, okay, introduction uh, of the Hong Kong Ophthalmology Society is by Dr. Yip, and after that is Dr. Alex. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so for the introduction, then that way. All right, sounds good. Okay. Karan, we can go live. Is the screen okay now? Uh, no, we can see all the other slides as well. We'll have to just do... Uh, use. Perhaps you don't use the presentation uh, uh, view because we can see the next slide on the screen as well. So you just use the... Use slideshow maybe. Yeah, the lower. Yes. Yeah. No, it's perfect. Uh, then I cannot see my note. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's lame, man. It's okay. <laughs> yes. Never mind then. <laughs> so, are we are ready. Going now. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me? I Can cannot you see me? your face. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. We will be ready in five minutes. Okay. So can you see, uh, I've shared my screen. Can you see, once, uh, can you see? Okay. Yeah. Can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, uh, Dr. Dr. Wing, we can hear you. Oh yeah, uh, I have, my video will be ready in five minutes, seems some connection error. But then uh, the PowerPoint I have tried to share, but, uh, but are you starting now? Because uh, see, uh, we have kept the settings in such a fashion that if there's already a presentation going on, nobody else on the panel will be able to share it. So only once this screen share okay. is stopped, only then you will be able to share it. Okay, I see. I, I, my PowerPoint is ready already. Okay, okay. so I think we can go uh, because uh, uh, we believe nonetheless, we have Dr. Alex going first. So we could still Thanks. get started. So uh, let's go live, Karan, in 10 seconds. Already is live, sir. Already is live. All right. All right. Um, I would like to welcome all the delegates present over here. We would like to thank you for giving us your valuable time. Uh, to get started with our second day, first session, we have our chairperson, Dr. P.P. Yip. We've got our co-chairperson, Alex, Dr. Alex Ng. We've got our moderator, Dr. Michelle Fan. We've got our convener, Dr. Wing Lau. And we've also got our co-convener, Dr. Lawrence, present over here. We'd like to thank them for giving us the time. And uh, I would request the moderator to please take this session ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Dr. Yip Poi Poi, a specialist in ophthalmologist, and I'm the president of the Hong Kong Ophthalmological Society. It is a privilege for us to uh, have the talk at the Delhi Ophthalmological Society International Conference. Thank you for inviting us to this uh, virtual platform. Um, this is our uh, current uh, council members of the Hong Kong Ophthalmological Society, which consists of uh, 19 council members. The Hong Kong Ophthalmological Society was founded in 1954 and it is committed to have a high professional standard of ophthalmic practice and increase public awareness of common and side threatening eye diseases in our community. We are established to foster brotherhood and sisterhood among eye care professionals in Hong Kong. The Hong Kong Ophthalmological Society is the earliest ophthalmic professional body established in Hong Kong. Over the years, Hong Kong OS has grown substantially, and currently we have more than 400 regular members representing most of the ophthalmologists actively practicing in Hong Kong. And our society has positioned itself as the core that binds all of us in the field of eye care. Our societies always strive to provide platform for continued medical education, both locally and internationally. Since 1983, we have hosted the ninth Congress of the Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology Conference in Hong Kong with great success. In 2008, 
Together with the College of Ophthalmologists of Hong Kong, Hong Kong OS hosts the World Ophthalmology Congress in conjunction with the APAO and the Chinese Ophthalmological Society together with our Hong Kong Ophthalmological Symposium. The meeting was a great success and was attended by over 13,000 delegates and exhibitors from more than 100 countries. Lately, the largest one is the Greatest Bay Ophthalmological Conference ASM 2019. Uh, which is the first symposium of the Greater Bay of Ophthalmology Conference in Hong Kong. Over the past 20 years, our society has done a list of public eye education campaigns with various themes. For the past 20 years, we have done a lot of public educations on conveying popular messages to our public, including both myopia, glaucoma, dry eye and age-related macular degeneration, etc., etc. Taking an example of the public education event in 2018, every public education event, we have press conference, news and media coverage, education booth, health talks, public eye screening, and celebrity with ambassadors publicizing the important message of eye care to our local community. We also done a lot of health thought series uh, in different uh, area in Hong Kong. And since 2020, we established our online educations full Zoom and also YouTube channel. Hopefully we can convey the proper message to our local community about the importance of eye care. With the concerted efforts of various members, both from public and private, senior and junior, uh, this is what we are now of the Hong Kong Ophthalmological Society. Indeed, the Hong Kong Ophthalmological Society contains our various committee, and in 2016, we established the Hong Kong Young Ophthalmologist Committee. And Hong Kong YO's committee compositions as currently now has shown here. Hong Kong YO pro provide a platform for, young, for youngsters, which is an important element in Hong Kong Ophthalmological Society to foster the young generations to be the future leaders of our society, taking care of our eye care health of the citizens. We have very close collaborations with the uh, Young Ophthalmology Society with India. We hope that in future, we also have the uh, further collaborations with uh, the, uh, the YO in, in India. This is the Hong Kong OS website. And so you have any further inquiry or to want to know more about our society, feel free to visit our website. Without further ado, the theme of our today's platform is called Myopia Management in Hong Kong. And this will be the list of the coming speakers. Without further ado, I'm now going to, going to uh, explain more about the myopic epidemiology in Hong Kong. I would like to acknowledge Dr. Jason Yam, who has produced and performed the landmark study uh, of the myopia in children in Hong Kong. Globally, we know that myopia bone is an important health burden issue amongst worldwide. 60 years ago, about 10 to 20% of the Chinese population was myopic. But today, it is up to 19% of teenagers and young adults in universities are myopia in Hong Kong. In 2020, Dr. Jason Yan starts the studies and have the epidemiology done and found that at least 13% of our local children who are six years old are myopic and 40% of primary school children are myopia. And also more than 95% of our university students are myopia with average of the myopia is minus three diopter. This is an important health issue, as we know that high myopia is associated with various side threatening complications, including myopic macular degeneration, retinal detachment, cataract, and glaucoma. And this table has shown the odds ratios related to different degree of myopia. So myopia will lead to severe cases and even permanent visual loss. 
And in order to have secondary prevention for these all, complica all these complications, it is important to retard myopia progression. In the coming talk by our council members of the Hong Kong Ophthalmological Society, it will highlight the various managements of myopia and its related complications. May I hand out the coming sessions to my colleagues? First, I want to introduce the second speaker, Dr. Alex Ng. His topic is about smile for high myopia corrections and the results of simultaneous cornea collagen cross-linking during SMILE. Now I would like to shift my platform to Alex first, while I will going to introduce Alex. Okay, uh, can, can, uh, can I share my screen? Okay, good, um, excellent. Dr. Alex Ng is, a private is now a current in private practice of Hong Kong Ophthalmic Associates. He is the adjunct assistant professor in School of Optometry, the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. He has past employment in clinical assistant professor, Department of Ophthalmology in the University of Hong Kong. Alex won a lot of awards internationally including the Japanese Ophthalmological Society International Young Investigator Award 2020. He also is the awardees of the APO Achievement Award in 2019 and the winner of the Refractive and Corneal Surgery in APAI CRS Film Festival 2017. Alex is also won the APAO Singapore Society of Ophthalmology Young Ophthalmologist Award in 2017. And Alex has published over more than 80 publications in SMILE, cross-linking, ocular surface disease, cataract surgery, and myopia. Without further ado, may I invite Dr. Alex Ng to give his talk on the smile of, uh, uh, about the SMILE-related uh, issues in high myopia. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Yip, for the kind introduction. So um, good morning, everyone. I'm Alex, and my talk will be on SMILE for high myopia correction and the use of simultaneous corneal collagen cross-linking. And these are my, um, <clears throat> so these are my financial disclosures. None, none are related to the topic of this talk. So um, as Dr. Yip has uh, introduced, uh, Hong Kong has the highest prevalence of myopia and we do have a very high demand for refractive surgery. Even during the time, um, even during the time of COVID, we still have a very high demand for refractive surgery. And as we all know, for high myopia, the choices include um, LASIK, SMILE, or the um, implant of ICLs. So um, for, for most patients, they usually uh, choose the laser refract refractive uh, correction because it's simpler. And for laser, we have LASIK and SMILE. So we all know that for SMILE, the advantage is they have less dry eye, they have a faster wound recovery, and they have a stronger biomechanical strength. But the maximum treatment is only minus 10 diopters. So if a patient has um, higher than minus 10 diopters, then our options will be back to LASIK extra or ICL. So if we compare the results of LASIK and SMILE, um, most of the studies we know, they, uh, they show that they have a comparable results. But for studies that are focusing on high myopia, uh, there are less paper on these um, subgroup of patients. But a recently published journal found that um, for patients with minus, minus eight to minus 10 diopters, um, they still showed a comparable um, outcome in terms of the uh, efficacy and also the safety for LASIK versus SMILE. So therefore, for my patients, if they are less than minus 10 diopters, but with a high myopia, SMILE is still my preferred treatment option because of the less dry eye, faster recovery, and also I believe they have a better um, long-term stability, and I will go into this later on. But then, as we, uh, as we all know, for patients with high myopia, they are more prone to having a regression of the, um, of the uh, uh, myopia. So when we are talking about regression, uh, there are many reasons for, for, for regression. Some people believe it's due to the um, epithel epithelial hypothesia. Some people believe that it is due to the biomechanical strength of the cornea. 
So uh, if we look at the long-term results of SMILE, um, uh, there are not there are only uh, several studies that have uh, long-term results. Most of this study tells you tells you that um, the long-term stability is pretty good for SMILE. For example, uh, the, the first uh, the group uh, in Germany they found a 0.48 diopters within five-year period, and other studies. Uh, such as this one, um, and also another one with a seven years of follow up, they all show you that uh, the regression for smile in general is pretty low. But uh, the longest follow up duration we have is the 10 year results from also the, the group by Blom et al. Uh, and they found that over 10 year period, the average regression weight was only 0 0.35 diopters. However, this one is an average because it is not only focusing on high myopia. Um, for patients with high myopia, so far um, we don't have very good evidence on the literature. So, as previously mentioned, in this group of high myopia patients, um, um, especially because of the biomechanical strength, because we, uh, the laser have modified the cornea by a, by a higher degree, so uh, we have a more reduction in the corneal biomechanical strength, and, 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 and it could give you more regression. So, when we are talking about the corneal biomechanics, um, when we look at SMILE versus LASIK, uh, there was a um, cadaveric eye study which compared both laser surgery and then they do a stress strain measurements in the lab. And they found that the cornea after LASIK is weaker than that um, after SMILE. So it means that uh, for the same amount of uh, myopic treatment, if it is SMILE, uh, the cornea is stronger than that after and LASIK. However, compared with the pre-op corneal biomechanical strength. We know that for both LASIK and SMILE, there is still a reduction in the corneal biomechanical strength. And as mentioned previously, if the corneal biomechanical strength is reduced, then uh, it may have an implication in the long-term stability, which can give you regression or even corneal ectasia. So in order to counter this reduction in the corneal biomechanical strength, uh, that's why uh, we nowadays in high myopic patients, we will do the simultaneous collagen cross-linking to increase back the strength. Because we all know that cross-linking is very successful in increasing the corneal biomechanical strength and therefore it's assessed in stabilizing patients with keratoconus. But then for this simultaneous cross-linking during refractive surgery, this becomes a prophylactic approach. So at uh, the term that we give it for the uh, simultaneous cross-linking during laser surgery, we call it extra. It can be laser extra or smile extra. So this name is actually given by the um, by the um, by the by the company uh, by Avidro. They they make this name to uh, so that patients uh, uh, it's easier for the patients to remember. So it is laser extra or smile extra. So the aim is to restore the corneal biomechanical strength, therefore to prevent regression and even ectasia. And it is a prophylactic treatment. So for the indications of smile extra, um, different surgeons, they have different approach. Some surgeons, they use the concept of the percentage of tissue altered, which is short-term PTA. And it is calculated by um, uh, dividing the, the, uh, the sum of flap thickness, or in case of smile, the cap thickness and the ablation depth with the uh, uh, central corneal thickness. And if the PTA is higher than 35%, uh, it is considered as high risk and you should do cross-linking. The other approach is they use the randomman scoring, which is the classical scoring system for the risk of ectasia during LASIK. And this table has summarized the, the scoring system with you. And some surgeons, if the random scoring is higher than three, then again, they will add the uh, simultaneous cross-linking. And some surgeons even, they just follow a straight cutoff. For example, a uh, certain level of corneal thickness, or if the uh, spherical equivalence correction is higher than certain amount, then they would add the simultaneous cross-linking. So far, there is no consensus on the, uh, as in the gold standard indication for smile extra yet. So I myself, I usually follow the PTA approach. So when we do the um, smile extra, uh, first we do the smile surgery, just like what we do usually. So after the laser, after dissecting and removing the smile lenticule, we then proceed to the uh, cross-linking part. We will infuse the riboflavin directly into the stromal pocket. And the duration of uh, uh, riboflavin soaking is usually uh, around one minute because without 
uh, because as we are inject, uh, infusing the riboflavin directly into the stroma, it takes much shorter time compared with our usual approach of the um, uh, uh, cross-linking in character conus. And then for the ultraviolet A, ultraviolet A irradiation, um, there are actually different approach in doing this. If we look at the classic cross-linking for keratoconus, um, the parameters that we can adjust is the power of irradiation and the duration. And the classic uh, power and duration is three milliwatts per centimeter square for 30 minutes. And this gives you a total energy of 5.4. And this is the classic we do for keratoconus treatment. And nowadays with the technique of accelerated cross-linking, we know that by increasing the irradiation power, we can reduce the irradiation duration. And by this, they also gives you the same amount of energy. So um, because uh, this 5.4 joules per centimeter square is a treatment dose for patients with actual keratoconus. Therefore, right now we are talking about simultaneous cross-linking as a prophylactic approach for laser refractive surgery. Therefore, for both laser extra or smile extra, we will use a less amount of uh, total energy will be adequate for this prophylactic approach. Therefore, if we look at the literature, when people first started doing laser extra or smile extra, they did use the 5.4 joules per centimeter square approach. But then later on, they found that this protocol, it takes too long and it gives you corneal haze and it also causes more fluctuation in the refraction in the early post-operative period. Therefore, um, Later on, most refractive surgeons, they try to reduce the duration of the irradiation as well as the total energy. Therefore, it will minimize the amount of corneal haze as well as it gives you a more stable refraction results. And some paper also uh, suggested that if the cross-linking energy is too high, it can give rise to more inflammatory response in the corneal stroma, which could, which could give you diffuse laminar keratitis. Therefore, the trend nowadays is to reduce the amount of um, uh, irradiation power and duration. So does this protocol work? Meaning that uh, by reducing the duration of irradiation or the, like the extra protocol as a whole, does it actually give you any effect? If we look at some ex vivo study, um, one, one ex vivo study by Canalopolis, um, they use a human donor cornea, they perform a smile surgery with it, and then they perform a corneal cross-linking. And then when they test the corneal rigidity, it does improve significantly, meaning that the smile extra protocol does give you strengthening result. Another study uh, by our group uh, a few years ago, we looked at patients with LASIK extra. Afterwards, uh, at the one month post-operative period, we performed an arterial salmon OCT. And we did find evidence of a corneal demarcation line in the, uh, in the anterior stroma. Because in, uh, in keratoconus, we know that after doing the cross-linking, we are able to see a corneal demarcation line um, in the cornea on anterior salmon OCT. Uh, as for Smile Extra, um, a more recent paper done, done um, in China, they did a confocal laser microscopy to look for morphological changes of the Smile Extra. And they, again, found a morphological evidence of um, structural change after doing the Smile Extra protocol. And again, on anterior SMN OCT, they were able to demonstrate the presence of a demarcation line, meaning that the uh, Smile Extra protocol did give you an actual strengthening cross-linking result. And another study uh, using an animal model done in Singapore, um, they used an animal model of LASIK. Uh, they, they actually, they have an animal model uh, that they could induce a ectasia of the laser. And uh, so they compare LASIK, smile, LASIK extra, and smile extra. And then they look at the, uh, whether there's any ectasia. And the way of detecting ectasia is by looking at the amount of posterior elevation after the procedure. And they found that after cross-linking, it did have a protective effect when compared with that without the simultaneous cross-linking. Therefore, you can see that in ex vivo study, animal study, or a confocal microscopy study, it does show you that the simultaneous cross-linking protocol did give you a effect. So for the results of um, Smile Extra, uh, the first paper was reported um, in Mexico a few years ago. In this group, they actually treated 
patients with actual keratoconus with smile extra. Uh, so at that time, uh, protocol use was the classic uh, Dresden protocol. And postoperatively, for two years, all the patients are stable. But because, as I said, the cross-linking uh, energy is uh, is the classic amount of the uh, total energy. Therefore, all the patient had corneal haste, uh, at, which was uh, at its maximum at postoperative one month. Another study um, uh, done by uh, Sri Ganesh uh, group. Uh, they this time these are not these are just normal uh, refractive surgery patients, no keratoconus, but they did have thin corneas and high amount of uh, refractive correction. So this time the their duration they have a reduced total uh, cross-linking energy at 3.4 joules per centimeter square, and in their study they found that after one year all the patients demonstrated a good safety outcome without any complications, and the um, and a few eyes did develop a uh, corneal haze, but then they, uh, the corneal haze uh, were resolved around three months afterwards. So uh, another study, it was reported by our group in Hong Kong. This time we use a even lower amount of uh, irradiation duration and power. And again, uh, in, with this protocol, we could uh, we demonstrated that all the patient had a good safety profile and also good refractive predictability. And because the total energy is lower, therefore there were no corneal haze observed. So, um, but you can see that all these uh, paper on Smile Extra, they did have a relatively short term of follow up because as I said at the beginning, the aim of doing the simultaneous cross-linking is to reduce the amount of regression. And we all know that to look at regression, we really need very long-term data. But the, term, but the problem with refractive surgery is that most patients, they do not come back for follow-up after a year. Therefore, uh, currently the amount of um, uh, uh, clinical evidence on, for example, what is the exact uh, amount of um, uh, cross-linking is needed, it is not known yet. So in summary, uh, we have a lot of uh, high myopia patients and SMILE is still my first choice as long as the patients has an adequate corneal thickness and also uh, when the myopia is uh, less than 10 minus 10 diopters. And if we look at the paper, look at, uh, look at, look at the current evidence we have, um, SMILE extra can potentially improve the long-term refractive stability. And it also gives you a comparable safety and efficacy with the conventional counterpart. But then, Regarding the protocol of doing the cross-linking, uh, for example, the amount of uh, irradiation power and the irradiation duration, we do not know what is the ideal amount yet. But I think the trend is we will use a total energy that is less than that we use for to treat patients with an actual keratoconus. Because by reducing the total amount of cross-linking energy, we can induce less corneal haze and also a better uh, refractive stability in the early post-operative period as well. So, um, and also for the indications, as I said, different surgeons have different approach. I myself, I usually follow the percentage of tissue altered approach. And hopefully in the future, when we have more long-term data or when we have a better measurement of the change in corneal biomechanical strength, then we could come up with the optimal uh, cross-linking protocol during uh, laser refractive surgery. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Uh, I would like to ask Ed, uh, if any participants and delegates would like to raise your questions to any one of our speakers, please make use of the Q&A sessions in the chat box and write down your questions and uh, we will answer the questions uh, uh, immediately after each presentation. Alex, um, there are two questions in the Q&A sessions. Uh, the Dr. Jadis will uh, ask any surgical video of simultaneous procedures. Uh, I think if this we may need some time to prepare it, isn't it? Or yeah, you I need to, will you want to demonstrate here or? Uh, I do have the surgery video, but not with this computer. It is in my office computer. So <laughs> I don't think I can find it today, but um, I, uh, to, 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 to summarize, what we do is I would use a 25 gauge needle, which is the, the cannula, which is the usual cannula that you use for uh, uh, flushing the stromal interface. So I would inject the ribofarbin solution um, 
which is a which is uh, which is actually the 0.22 percent riboflavin, and I would just irrigate the entire stromal pocket, and you will see it becomes yellow. So after one minute, I would flush it again with the usual balance of solution, and then afterwards we would. Um, um, I will just uh, clean up the wound and then we will move the patient's bed uh, outward a little bit. And then we just use the usual um, cross-linking uh, on the cornea and that's it. So it is actually um, um, a, a very simple procedure. And for the next questions, uh, for the facial recovery compared with normal smile, um, as I said, the, uh, the, the energy protocol that I use is of a low energy protocol. But then I think the most important thing is for the first six hours immediately after the smile procedure. For the, for the usual smile, patients do not experience any pain. At most, it is only a mild um, foreign body sensation. But for patients with smile extra, for the first six hours, um, there can be significant swelling and tearing because the, uh, the irradiation power that I used was, the, was 30 milliwatts per centimeter square. Uh, square. So it is basically a patient with have a very mild um, UV keratitis kind of symptoms in the first six hours. So I usually will give the patient a painkiller and I would also advise them to go home and take a nap for the first six hours. So that after the first six hours, then the swelling and also the tearing uh, uh, will disappear. And then when they come back during day one follow up, uh, I have never seen any epithelial defects or even uh, 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 corneal erosions. Uh, we do not see this uh, on day one. So it's only mainly pain during the, in, on, during the first few hours. And then uh, afterwards, sometimes with uh, patients after smile extra, we, do, we, we can see a very mild um, corneal haze in the interface, but the haze is very mild compared with those after treating keratoconus and the facial acuity is usually not affected. So for most of our patients on day one, they already have a 1.0 facial acuity already. But sometimes uh, during, the, uh, uh, during the refraction um, for the first few months, I'm uh, sorry, for the first few weeks, there can be a higher uh, fluctuation in the, uh, in the refraction. But most patients, they do achieve a stable refraction at the uh, three months post-operative visit. And therefore, during the smile surgery, no matter if it is smile or smile extra, I will employ the same uh, uh, surgeon's normogram in the correction. Thank you, Alex. If there is no more, um, oh, uh, Dr. Jadis has another uh, comment questions. Uh, would Alex want to answer it also? Faculties are wearing my opaque glasses. How you cancel your patients for refractive surgery? Okay, uh, you mean as in like doctor wearing glasses? Um, <laughs> I think, I, yeah, hmm. yes. I tell them I myself, I'm emetropic. My wife had LASIK and many of my classmates, even some of our ophthalmologist colleagues had, had, had done LASIK or smile. And I, I, do, I did a part of many of on my medical school classmates and this is how I counsel my patients. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. It's a difficult question indeed. Okay. Oh, it's easy for me because so, I wear glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alex. So uh, then maybe, maybe may I invite Dr. Michelle Fan preparing for coming and uh, coming talk. Thank you, Alex. Oh, the comings uh, and the second presentations will be done by Dr. Michelle Fan. Uh, her topic is on pearls in performing cataract surgery in highly myopic eyes. Dr. Fan is currently the corneal specialist working as an associate consultant at Donghua Eastern Hospital. She is a council member of a current the Hong Kong Ophthalmological Society. And is Michelle okay for the presentations? Yes, thank you, uh, Prabhu, yes, for the uh, introduction. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to today's Hong Kong of Neurological Society presentation on the topic of myopic uh, management in Hong Kong. And uh, I'm Michelle. My topic today is uh, pearls in performing cataract surgery in highly myopic eyes. Before I start, I would like to thank uh, DOS for the kind invitation uh, for us to present the data uh, to our, uh, in Hong Kong to our audience.
So uh, uh, I think all of us might notice that the cataract uh, is associated with high mouth here from various studies, including the study that um, uh, Pupu mentioned earlier before. So it's not uncommon for us to perform cataract operation in high mouth patient. And they do present a little bit earlier cataract. So um, a successful cataract operation start uh, from a detailed preoperative assessment to intraop and to postop. Uh, during the preoperative assessment, we have to ask the detailed history from the patient, including whether there is any history of amblyopia, which uh, might affect the visual potential. And it also may affect uh, uh, result in fixations which diplopia if we perform the amblyopic eye before the better eye. And laser refractive surgery is a very important history. It may also affect the RL power choosing formula and also the measurement method we use in this kind of patient. Medical history, uh, we may note that a systemic disease may be related to high myopia and affect the cataract operation. For example, in cases of Marfan syndrome, the lens status uh, may not be very stable and it also have, uh, related to high myopia. So we may have to pay special attention during the operation in this patient. Drug history, aspirin and anticoagulant is also important. Uh, in very high myopia patient, we might ask them to stop before the operation because uh, we noticed that the uh, uh, high myopic patients, uh, there's a higher risk of a mass massive suprachoroidal hemorrhage during the cataract operation. When it comes to the physical examination, we have to note the AC depth, the density of the cataract, and whether the lens is stable or not. And more importantly, the patient's cooperativeness for the topical or local anesthesia. Because for very long axial length uh, eyes, we may try to avoid the retrobulbar uh, anesthesia and uh, peribulbar or even subtenon anesthesia may be the option if you really want a very uh, immobile eye uh, during the uh, um, uh, cataract operation in addition to the topical anesthesia. Other highly high myopic related ocular disease such as glaucoma, retial break or detachment or macroschisis or myopic CNV, we also have to pay attention because this not only affects the visual potential, but also you might consider whether you want to treat the, this kind of disease before the cataract or during the operation. Uh, at the same time, for example, a uh, combined operation for the PPV and cataract operation for macroschisis. This all affect your surgical planning. Patient, we also have to assess the patient whether they are cooperative and also explore, explore their uh, post-operative refractive expectation, such as whether they are new work dominant or distant work dominant, where the, where, whether they want to have their glasses and whether uh, is there is any concern of the post-operative anisometropia or if, if they really want to have a, a monovision to correct their presbyopia as well. Biometry in high myopic patient remain, a challenge, remain, uh, remain challenging because the accuracy decreases as the, uh, as the axial length increases. The presence of the posterior staphyloma uh, is a concern because uh, the apex of the staphyloma may not uh, be where the fovea lies. If we use the ultrasound biometry in this patient, uh, it may render in, incorrect measurement of the axial length. If the patient is able to uh, have, the bet, uh, have a good fixation, it's better to use the automated biometry, such as the hour master. And in this high myopic eye, there are different maculopathy, and it also affects the fixation, uh, resulting in accurate measurement of the axial length. There is also systematic error uh, because we use the standard, standardized refractive index, which may not be as accurate as the witches in high myopic eyes take up a greater proportion of the group and undergo synergesis earlier. And also for a patient with previous laser refractive surgery, we may have to pay attention to the formula we use uh, for this uh, uh, patient uh, to choose the RL power. In cases with patients with previous laser refractive surgery, uh, uh, we have to pay a, a special attention uh, 
uh, how, how can we know that whether the patient have it or not? We can check the K value of the patient. The normal K value is ranging from 40 to 46. In post-myopic refractive surgery patient, the K value is usually smaller. You can also consider using a pentacam to have a look of the uh, back to front ratio. Uh, if the back to front ratio is less than 80%, it indicates that the patient may have previous myopic refractive surgery. The Royal College of Ophthalmology recommend the LA family according to the axial length. For the high myopia patient with the axial length greater than 26, they recommend SRKT formula. We also recommend the usage of fourth generation formula such as Holiday 2, uh, Barrett Universal 2 or Osnan formula if, the, if you are uh, do, doing patient with high myopia uh, cataract. So you can find the uh, Barrett Universal 2 formula calculator on the apacrs.org website. Uh, this formula can be used uh, for all eyes regardless of their SEO length. When it comes to the RL selection, uh, I have to remind you that not all the brands of the RL have the low power uh, as uh, for the myopic patient. For example, for Tagnus, the ESSCB uh, uh, model, the RL power only down to one, plus five. Uh, if you want a plus five or less RL, you may consider using other brand of RL. So it comes to the intraoperative challenge so uh, why is it challenging in myopic eye? Because the complication increases 1.224 for every increase in one millimeter in the axial length. And the PCR tear is up to 9.3% uh, for axial length greater than 27 millimeter. Sonia dehyson and anterior capsule tear do have a, 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 around 1.7% 1 1 for longer axial length, longer than 30 millimeter. In high myopic eye, the richest pressure is lower, so it's very difficult to express the nucleus if you do the ECCE. So if FACO is possible, we prefer FACO. And the uh, scale rigidity is lower, so there may be higher chance of wound leak. So we may consider using a longer corneal wound or even suture the wound uh, at the conclusion of the operation. The sudden change in intracord pressure causes a uh, distending pain in the patient. So in one study, it uh, uh, compared the uh, topical uh, an anesthesia uh, versus the topical plus the intracranial local anesthesia in this patient and found that in, uh, with the extra intracranial local anesthesia, uh, the pain tolerance is better in this patient. The sonia is a loser uh, uh, compared to the normal eye, so we encourage a complete hydrodissection and a more gentle rotation of nucleus during the operation. In high myopic eyes, the AC is very deep, so it's better to lower the bottle height before the insertion of the irrigation or FACO Pro. In case you come across the lens iris diaphragm retropulsion potion syndrome, we re recommend you use a Sinsky to gently lift the iris, uh, elevate the iris from behind to release the deep AC. And also, there's a higher chance of a superchoroidal hemorrhage during the operation. As mentioned before, you might consider stopping aspirin or any anticoagulant before the operation if the patient is uh, physically fit to do so. And try to avoid PCR sonolysis and avoid sudden change in intraocular pressure and make sure you've got a tight wound seal. During the post-operative uh, period, uh, we may have to pay attention if there's any late complication, for example, the wound, whether there's a wound leak. Uh, we also encourage earlier fungal examination, uh, especially in patients present with new onset of floaties or flashes to just to rule out the retinal tear or retinal detachment. We may explore if the patient able to tolerate the anisometropia and uh, may need a, a arranged a fellow eye earlier cataract operation if they cannot tolerate that. If you put it in a toric RL in high myopic eye, there, high, there is a higher chance of rotation. So uh, you have to really look uh, at, in early post-op and intervene if that's the case. In cases, if you put in a sulcus RL, there's a higher chance of decentration because the sulcus is larger. 
and pay attention to any refractive surprise in to treat if there's an uh, in this case and to treat early if necessary. In summary, for cataract operation in high, highly myopic eyes, uh, there's increase in refractive surprise, intraoperative and postoperative complication. However, it can be prevented if we're able to pay attention to potential problem and handle them preemptively. Detailed preoperative pre assessment is needed for surgical planning. Repeated measurement and verification with different measure, uh, me machine with appropriate ILL formulae could drastically, drastically reduce refractive surprise. Thank you. I think you have to unmute yourself. Sorry, we cannot hear. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Dr. Fan. And for any delegates who would like to ask any questions, please you make use of the Q&A platform and we'll welcome any questions from Dr. Fan. Uh, Michelle, there is a question from Dr. Jadish. Yes. Do you do barrier laser P operatively for those high, highly myopic eye do, performing cataract surgery? Uh, if I find any uh, retinal breaks, I do perform the uh, barrier laser uh, for them before the cataract operation. And we have to wait like four weeks before uh, operation because uh, the laser do take time to consolidate. So, but if there's uh, nothing in the red, uh, back of the eye, there's no retinal degeneration, uh, no, or no uh, breaks, uh, I will just proceed for my uh, cataract operation for this eye. Yes, I fully agree. Yeah. So if no more further questions, will uh, Dr. Ho, Lo, uh, yes, Dr. Ho Wing Lau, Dr. Ho will going to present our next presentation. Our next presentation's topic is, is it a glaucoma diagnostic dilemma in highly myopic eyes? Uh, Dr. Ho Wing Lau is currently the uh, council members of the Hong Kong Ophthalmological Society. He is the associate consultant of the Queen's Mary a hospital as well as Grantham Hospital. He is also the um, associate adjunct uh, assistant professors of the Hong Kong University. So may I invite Dr. Ho to present the topic uh, about glaucoma in highly myopic eyes. Thank you, Dr. Ho. So uh, thank you for DOS for inviting us for this presentation. So uh, can you see my PowerPoint? So yes, we can see it. Okay, so uh, so we, we better start now. So uh, so my topic will be uh, as a glaucoma specialist, we are always facing with some dilemma in case with patients with highly myopic eyes. So that's why I'm talking about this uh, this in this session. So this is my financial disclosure is none, and then uh, so this is a very good illustration based on Chinese philosophy, but also also about how we are going to diagnose but um, uh, the current situation of how we are going to diagnose uh, glaucoma in patients with high myopia. So in ideal situation, there, has, there would be a clear cutoff that the patient is having glaucoma or not having glaucoma. But, uh, but the actual situation is that in the arena of those called glaucoma patients, they're always suspect of borderline case. And for those who are initially screened negative for glaucoma, there's always a suspicion or there's always a chance of progression uh, for, for those who are initially stable. So how uh, the problem that we always face as glaucoma specialists is that the prob uh, problem of glaucoma and myopia are always linked together. And then there has been, a, uh, there's a, there's been an increase in the odds of uh, glaucoma in high myopic patients. Mm -hmm. And then a... Uh, can you see? Can you see me? You cannot see me. Okay. Sorry. It's okay. Okay. Uh, can, you, okay. can you see can, me? You can see the slides, but just not your face. So don't don't worry. We can see the slides. Okay. So so okay. So 
So I think I think maybe I uh, uh, I think maybe I continue with the presentation first. Okay. Yes. Yes. Please. So, Thank you. Yes. Um, maybe some technical area. So uh, so there has been some odds of glaucoma is high in myopic patients, and then there has been a meta analysis in two thousand and one. It shows that there has been an increase in odds ratio of one point nine two for myopic patients, and then the, and then even for higher myopic overall is nine point uh, one point nine two. And then for lower myopia, there's been an odds of 1.65. And for high myopia, it's around 2.46. And then there's also been confirmed in some of the population-based studies, like the Ponsa and Rotterdam study. And then uh, uh, on the other hand, this uh, myopia always causes an increase in susceptibility of glandular cells to mechanical stress, probably due to the uh, axial elongation, stretching, the, uh, and thinning the laminar cribosa. And then the deformation of the globe will cause torsion and tilting, causing some mechanical stress on the uh, retinal ganglion cells. And then one of the more practical issues is that the myopic features are somehow quite similar to glaucomatous changes. So uh, <clears throat> in order for us to tackle this problem, we need to know how we usually approach glaucoma patients. We usually start the glaucoma diagnosis by, first of all, understanding the glaucoma disease as a degenerative optic nerve disease. And then we need to know the uh, progression and also the history uh, of the duration of progression of disease presentation. And then we uh, start with the history and then we uh, go by step, step by step approach. Uh, traditionally, we, uh, we would do the clinical examination of the optic disc, in particular to the cup disc ratio but uh, in recent years, there has also been a uh, concern with whether we should detect for retinal nerve uh, fiber defect in our clinical examination. And then traditionally, the glaucoma is defined using the humphrey rucherfield analysis. But of course, right now, uh, we, we do have some additional, additional uh, diagnostic tools and commonly we use the OC, OCT for diagnose, uh, diagnosing glaucoma. So uh, we, we tackle these problems one by one. So uh, if we want to diagnose a patient with glaucoma using optic disc examination, what are the problems that we're going to have? The, uh, the most important thing is that there has always been myopia-related change of the optic disc. It is very difficult to delineate the cup as the rim may show pallor and the cupping may be difficult to tell as the club is different and then there will be, there will be uh, peripheral atrophy, which, uh, which makes it difficult to delineate which is exactly the uh, which is exactly the area the cup is covering, and then um, and also uh, also there will be myopic atrophy, which makes the delineation of the surrounding retinal nerve fiber layers very difficult. And then, as we all know, that the beta the, the, is actually the uh, beta zone in the peripapillary atrophy, which is more related to glaucoma. But in myopic patients, if, if we do have recall what we have the experience with those myopic patients, it's very difficult to tell between the uh, different zones of peripheral atrophy. So then it's very difficult for us to have a clear delineation of either the optic the cup disc ratio, optic disc cup disc ratio, and also whether there are any genuine retinal nerve fiber, uh, fiber layer defect in a clinical examination. So this is not very reliable in particular in uh, myopic patients. And then, uh, then we go on from clinical examination to visual field examination. This is the classical, uh, we have classical diagnostic, uh, diagnostic criteria for glaucoma like the Anderson criteria. And then this is a functional assessment of optic nerves. But what is the problem is that the, uh, the structural changes as we all know now is usually before, before functional changes. So then when we are detecting for visual field changes in particularly in myopic patients, it's all already usually mid or late stage. And then uh, in, order, in order to make the visual field reliable, instead of the best scenario will be that we get the functional changes in accordance with the structural changes. For example, if we have a OCT, which shows compatible retinal fiber layer loss, in the area which is having visual field defect, we can be certain that it's likely to be glaucoma. But somehow this is very difficult, uh, difficult to match in uh, reality. And then there has always been coexisting maculopathy, 
which in my opinion, uh, which will affect the risk, risk, risk accuracy and also the chance that it is going to having a reliable visual field. And then um, there's been classical, a uh, classical pattern detected in myopic glaucoma is that the uh, early central or paracentral sarcoma. But this is sometimes very difficult to match. In particular, if, uh, as my myopic patient may usually have some other comorbidities like cataract or maybe myopic degeneration which mix up with this uh, what we call the classical pattern. So some of the, to tackle this problem, some may actually suggest a combine of 10-2 uh, and 24-2 in order to detect for more subtle changes. But uh, we have to note that practically there will be with uh, patient practicability. And one additional practical tip is that somehow the visual field examination may be influenced by the prismic, defect, uh, prismic effect if the patient is wearing highly myopic glasses. So will optical coherence tomography help in this scenario? So the, this is, uh, as we all know, is the key investigation in structural assessment of the optic disc. And then the two, there are two main areas to be studied, the neuroretinal rim and the periperipular retinal nerve fiber layer. And then the retinal nerve fiber layer has always been the main diagnostic criteria in when we are de 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 determining whether the patient is having glaucoma. So, when, but then the, the that's the problem is that the machine based algorithm is usually uh, usually relies on how we define the brush membrane. However, the margin of brush membrane may move away from the temporal optic disorder, which may actually artificially increase the disc size. And also the rim may also be indiscernible if we look at the raw data when we get what we got from the optical coherence tomography. So then uh, just a uh, recap of what we call the classical, uh, what the classical features when we are uh, evaluating myopic patients, there will be supertemporal in uh, infratemporal bundles getting close temporally and temporally. And then there may be abnormally thickened RNFL temporally, but phenol inferior and superiorly. And then, deep, however, these, these features are not included in the normal, uh, normal uh, normative database in commonly available, uh, the commercially available machines. So then actually, if we want to make the features more, more practical and more easily to use, then you can diagnose it in one go, then we actually need, uh, need the high myopia normative database. So some of the, uh, as, we, as we have discussed, that we have the laminar cribosa uh, deformation in highly myopic patients. Some, some began, to, uh, began to see whether there would be any use if we use laminar cribosa imaging. And then in fact, there will be, uh, there will be findings uh, like the laminar cribosa defects in myopic patients in glaucoma. Uh, glaucoma. However, the issue is that this, uh, this involves extended depth imaging, which is not a standard protocol of, of uh, what we do for optical uh, OCT assessment of these myopic patients. And then uh, there is, uh, and in addition, uh, currently laminar cribosa imaging is actually a qualitative, uh, qualitative study instead of quantitative study. And no, uh, no commercially available protocol is available for our daily, daily use. So then actually we need to do the, all the measurements manually, which is not practical. In terms of uh, in terms of uh, clinicians, so then, so then this uh, this is a, uh, this is not something that will be useful, uh, useful in the uh, in the practical clinical setting. So then, uh, some some uh, in view of the de deformation near the optic uh, optic disc, some uh, some some people will actually target at the ganglion cell and inner plexiform layer evaluation, hoping that. The macular changes will actually mirror the uh, actually mirror the changes that happens in the uh, in the optic disc, and then, uh, however, uh, however, uh, as we all know that myopic patients are not always presenting with tilted disc and PPA alone. Sometimes they actually have myopic uh, myopic maculopathy as well. So then, uh, and in addition, there has been posterior stretch. Which, which makes the measurement in normal patients not, uh, not as practical or not as applicable in those patients with high myopia. So then this may, in case if the patient is not having a, having a, normal, uh, is having a normal macula, I think this may be as a supplement, but then it's, it's not 
that useful in particular if uh, for highly myopic patients which have um, a, a myriad of various uh, uh, different uh, different pathologies as related to myopia so then there uh, so uh, so where are we going apart from the traditional uh, traditional uh, modalities in terms of vascular evaluation there has been a raised uh, raised interest in particular with the availability of the OCT angiography uh, there has been evidence showing that the vessel density and also the corrosive thickness to be reduced in myopia. And then there will be also be reduced blood flow, also found in glaucoma. Uh, however, uh, well, uh, however, currently the OCTA is also still a uh, qualitative uh, assessment and then it's not quant quantitative, which makes the, how, uh, makes the practicability rather, rather limited. And then uh, we use we try to see we are we're trying to see that uh, whether any generalized with the focal defects, which may help to tell the difference between myopia, which is tend to be a generalized defect versus uh, versus uh, glaucoma, which is a focal defect. So, in uh, as uh, in addition to vascular uh, vascular uh, vascular evaluation, there has been also some interest in the uh, in the electrophysiology there, uh, there's been findings showing that steady state electroretinography uh, electroretinogram amplitude and standard deviation phase are affected by glaucoma and not myopia however if you have experience with electrophysiology you know that this is a very timely uh, it is time consuming procedure which makes uh, which makes uh, and also the noise which are caused by the env environment and also the patient artifact may not be that uh, may actually cover up the genuine changes. So then, this is uh, this is mainly for the research interest. But uh, in terms of practicability, this is it has not been uh, well well incorporated into our, in our clinical practice at this current moment, unless there have been improvement in how we can reduce the noise and how to shorten the uh, shorten the uh, investigation. So then, uh, uh, glaucoma. So recently, uh, recently, the, uh, the uh, all people are paying attention to artificial, artificial intelligence, and then a machine, a machine learning, and then they have that they have been using various modalities, including photos, OCT findings, OCTA, and also, uh, and also, uh, they they are combining all these modalities. Um, uh, they they have shown some reliable, uh, so so some uh, early promising results. Uh, doing that is uh, they are very useful in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of diagnosing glaucoma. However, the design uh, the, the the usefulness of the artificial intelligence and machine learning are actually heavily relying on the protocol or the algorithm behind. So then, uh, it is actually be uh, it is very it's very important if we got uh, a very well designed algorithm in order to make it useful. So I think that this, uh, for today's presentation uh, is very difficult for it. it's still a uh, it's still a unsolved question whether how we can how we can tell clearly whether this patient is having glaucoma or whether it's only purely myopic changes and uh, individual modalities of in, uh, of all the investigation that we have covered all have their shortcomings and then the, and also there have been a great uh, element in subjective arbitration at this uh, at this time. Maybe machine learning may help, but not not in the near future, uh, not in the present moment. And then time is an also an another important domain. Whether we can tell that whether there's a glaucoma, as we all know, the glaucoma is a progressive optic neuropathy. So then the combination and also the artificial intelligence may be the road ahead. But then uh, right now we are a glaucoma specialists. We still face this problem day to day. So. Um, so our team is still also collecting the, some data from IOP patients and artificial intelligence. And we hope that we can share some more information about this progress in the near future. So I think that's, uh, that's all I want to cover for day, today. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ho. And I welcome any questions from participants using the Q&A platform. Dr. Ho, there are some questions related to the uh, glaucoma aspect in highly myopic eyes. Uh, some doctors may want to know more about uh, if there is any practical tips on assessing highly myopic patients 
who may have glaucoma? Do you have any pearls that can give uh, more practical points to the audience? Uh, so I think that I think that I think that uh, currently my my practical point will, uh, my practical view would be uh, uh, first of all I uh, try to find for structural uh, structural and functional co uh, structural uh, and functional uh, structural compatibility. That means that uh, if in case of a patient with highly myopia, I try to see uh, the, for the OCT findings. Uh, OCT find uh, OCT finding whether that's uh, as compatible uh, as compatible with the visual field change. If that's the uh, if that's the case, then I would uh, I would think that it's more likely to be related, uh, likely to be a genuine glaucoma. And then uh, an important domain will be uh, as I, I mentioned that this time is a very important uh, time is a very important functional uh, time is a very important do uh, diagnostic domain in terms of glaucoma. So then, I, I for patients which are really having some uh, subtle subtle difference, I would tend to repeat that uh, repeat the, all the investigation in a shorter interval. So then, to make uh, try to pick up the earlier changes. So then, to to make it uh, to make it uh, to make it uh, better uh, to make it easier to detect for the early change. And so then, the, these are my the practical approaches. But I do, uh, I do think that this is uh, this is really something that uh, there's not there's not going to be a perfect solution at this point. Mm. Thank you. And do you think the CCT, the corneal thickness, corneal thickness, will help in uh, assessing these patients? So I think that. So, so I think that uh, there has been some reason, reason for uh, reason, uh, reason discussion about the C the use of uh, of the, of the CCT. Uh, but uh, my 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 understanding is that CCT is <clears throat> uh, somehow overly overly used as a surrogate, as the uh, as a or the deformity of the globe. And then actually, the anterior part and the posterior part of the globe is actually it's actually where uh, the structure is different, and then the central corneal thickness is actually only a refraction of part, partly of the mechanical strength of the anterior um, anterior part of the globe, and then actually the posterior part may not be the same, and then some actually uh, some actually some studies actually cover the corneal hysteresis as related to the uh, central corneal thickness. But then, uh, the, uh, but then the finding is surprisingly that the CCT is not very reliable reflection of the corneal hysteresis. So I think that uh, uh, somehow I, I tend to, uh, in recent years, I tend to put a lower importance in terms of CCT, in terms of uh, in the management of glaucoma, because because this is uh, because because we are, we are not actually telling uh, we are not telling uh, actually. Talking about the globe as a whole, which uh, and the posterior part, the laminar fibrosa, where the optic nerve is actually being uh, being attacked, is totally is not that uh, compatible with the anterior changes. Okay, thank you, Doctor Ho. Uh, maybe we can leave extra questions to the end of the presentation. And uh, may I invite the next speaker, Dr. Norwens Liu. Uh, his topic of presentation is the management of visual retinal complications in highly myopic eyes. Dr. Lawrence Liu is currently in an associate consultant at the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences, Prince of Wales Hospital. And, and also he is the honorary clinical assistant professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He is a visual retinal specialist and he is also our council members of the Hong Kong Ophthalmological Society. May I invite Dr. Liu to give the, uh, his experience on managing highly myopic eyes, especially those who have visual retinal complications. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Thank you, Dr. Yip. Hello, everyone. Um, it's my great honor to attend the DOS International Conference this year. My name is Lawrence, I'm from Hong Kong. Uh, I will talk about uh, the management of retroretinal complications in high myopia today. So first of all, I have no financial interest to disclose. I would like to start a little bit about the definitions. So we say a person has high myopia if the refractive error is more than minus six diopters, or if the axial length is more than 26.5 millimeters. 
And we say a person has a pathological myopia if the person has high myopia, and in addition, he has some uh, pathological changes of the retina due to elongations of the eyeball. And these are the uh, pathological changes, retinal changes that you may see in patients with pathological myopia. For example, the uh, optic disrailing, uh, optic distilting, tessellated fundus, carotenoid atrophy, macular atrophy, lacquer cracks, full spots, posterior staphyloma, et cetera. And these are the major retroretinal complications in a high myopia, which are indicated for surgery. For example, myopic full schizes, macular hole rift or rift out detachment, and also rheumatogenous retinal detachment. However, operation surgical interventions for these eyes is not very straightforward due to several reasons. First of all, these eyes, the axial length is pretty long. Some of them can reach more than 30 millimeters uh, uh, in length. And therefore, when you operate in these eyes, the instruments have to be put in a very vertically positioned in order to work on these eyes. And these uh, vertically positioned instruments have some problems. For example, you can touch off the uh, viewing system and therefore disturbing your uh, surgical view. And there's a compression of the globe may result in some corneal striae, further disturbing your uh, surgical operations view. And also the instruments may not be long enough to reach the posterior pole. And also secondly, these eyes usually have very um, decreased retinal contrast due to the large many areas of the correctional atrophy and also macular atrophy. And therefore it becomes uh, difficult to visualize the epigretinal membrane and also internal limiting membrane. And therefore operations may uh, result have a risk of an incomplete membrane removal or inadvertent retinal trauma. And third, this eye usually has very tight retroretinal adhesions. And this is common to have at the same time ritual schizes. And therefore it is difficult to induce PRD posterior ritual detachment and you may encounter multiple layers of preretinal ritual tissue before you encounter the internal limiting membrane. The retina is thin, friable, and it breaks easily. So there are these eyes in operations, you, have, you need to have some considerations, some preparations in order to overcome these surgical challenges. So first of all, for the long axial length of the eyeball, uh, we will create the sclerotomy slightly further away from the limbus Usually in the pseudophagic eye, we place the sclerotomy at 3.5 millimeters behind the limbus. But in these eyes, even if it is pseudophagic, we consider to put it a little bit further away at four millimeters, even if it's a pseudophagic eye. So therefore the instrument will not touch the reading system that easily and it adds a little bit more working distance for you. And you have to prepare some especially designed long shaft instruments in order to reach the posterior pole. And if these long shaft instruments are not available in the institutions, you may consider to use a 23 gauge instead of a 25 gauge instruments because the 23 gauge does not have the um, a stiffening sleeve of uh, as in a 25 gauge, which may add one or two millimeters in addition a working distance for you. And if, if these uh, modifications still, you're still not able to reach the posterior pole, you may consider to remove the cannula after the retractomy, which will add a little bit more distance for you to reach the posterior pole. And in the operation of these side, the macular surgeries consider to use a contact lens instead of a non-contact ring system to avoid touching of the uh, non-contact ring system, which distort your surgical view. So more liberal use of dye is necessary to improve the retinal contrast to visualize the epiretinal membrane and internal limiting membrane. And remember, you may come across with uh, multiple layers of the uh, pre-retinal ridges before you come across with the uh, internal limiting membrane. So you may have to dye multiple times, peel multiple times uh, to ensure that the whole things, the whole internal limiting membrane has been removed. So for these eyes, usually they have tight retroretinal adhesions. So in cases where you think that the PRD, the posterior ridges detachment seems already have present, you still need a staining to look for any residue ridges because it's likely that they have some ritual schizes. And also you may need some special instruments uh, to help lift up to the edge of the posterior hyaloid and internal limited membrane to initiate the uh, peeling. And finally, because the retina is very thin and friable, so I advise you to, when you ingest the diet, inject it very gently and not too close to the retina to avoid the iotrogenic retinal damage and macular hole formations. So here I will go through some additional considerations for some of the conditions. For example, myopic full-field schizes. 
multiple sclerosis occur because there's a very tight inner retinal adhesions. And at the same time, the outer retina keeps on progressively elongating, progressive outer retinal stretchings from the elongation of the eyeball. Therefore, this results in the splitting of the retinal tissue. The full-field cases can occur with or without uh, full-field detachment. And our standard operations for these cases, we do a vitrectomy, internal limiting membrane peeling, with or without a gas tamponade. And for the RM peeling, it's important, as I mentioned, you have to use the dye to, all the, to make sure that uh, all the uh, pyrectal richest tissue has been removed, that you, have, uh, that you are encountering the internal limiting membrane and to remove the internal limiting membrane. And you may consider to do the full view sparing IRM peel, which means that you peel the IRM uh, from RK to RK to move the whole macula, but you leave behind a one this diameter of IRM as the full view. The theoretical advantage of this procedure, this uh, uh, method is that it is uh, considered to preserve the fulvular mullet cells integrity. It also reduces the risk of uh, post-operative -ma post macular hole formations. However, there's uh, some drawback of this uh, this uh, uh, surgery, leaving the internal lipid membrane as the fovea has a potential risk of uh, delayed late IRM contractions and uh, retinal thickening involved in the fovea. And this is a more technically demanding procedure and you need more tissue manipulations. And whether to put in gas tamponade is still a, a rather controversial uh, issue. The third type of advantage is that uh, the inner retina with the gas can adhere better to the posterior staphyloma. And it also helps you to tap it against uh, unnoticeable uh, macular holes. However, meta-analysis suggests that with the gas, there's no additional uh, significant impact on the visual acuity or the rate of the resolutions. And in terms of me, it increases the risk of uh, some complications, for example, hemorrhage, transiently raised intraocular pressure, et cetera. So how about a macular hole with a without detachment? Uh, these are the standard procedures for macular hole with a retractomy, IM peel with a breakdown inverted RM flap and a uh, gas tamponade. The importance of the RM peel is that it reduces the retinal rigidity and improves the retinal compliance and hence improves the closure rate of macular hole. It also reduces post-operative ERM formations and meta-analysis suggests that it also reduces the risk of macular hole reopening. And you may consider to do an inverted RM flap uh, the theoretical advantage is that it facilitates the macular hole closure by providing a flap which contains muller cell fragments to induce the glial cells proliferation. And it also provides a scaphoid for the retinal tissue to approximate. But it is uh, more technically demanding, you need more uh, tissue manipulations to do the inverted RM flap. And the gas tapana is a standard procedure. We use long acting gas, either 12% C3F8 or 20% SF6. Uh, followed by post-operative phase time posture for one week. And if the macular hole is with a detachment, uh, we'll advise you to avoid drainage of the uh, subretinal fluids directly through the macular hole. Because if you drain the subretinal fluid directly through the macular hole, it will run the risk of macular hole enlargement when the fluid comes out from the hole. And I would, uh, if it's only a small amount of subretinal fluid, I will just leave it behind and uh, put in the gas and it will be uh, reabsorbed uh, spontaneously. But if there's a large amount of subretinal fluid, say uh, extending beyond the macula, then I will consider to do a retinotomy outside the macula, outside the agate for the drainage of the subretinal fluid. And after the gas, I will put in the laser to do a retinal paxi. And for the peeling of the IRM in, in, in the setting of a detached retina, I will peel the IRM uh, before a drainage of subretinal fluid. Because the uh, um, detached retina, it is get closer to you, it is easier to peel, and I also consider to do an inverted iron and flap in these cases. So this is a summary for your schizes and myopic macular hole are two major retroretinal complications in highly myopic eyes. Operation in these eyes have uh, such challenges and difficulties, and we need some special considerations. However, many of these difficulties can be overcome by modification of techniques, some special considerations and use of uh, special instruments. And these are my references. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Is there any questions for the uh, visual retinal complications for highly myopic eyes? Please raise it at the Q&A sessions. 
in the interest of time, maybe we go uh, go back some of the questions that was asked. I, I think Dr. Fans has already answered uh, in words about the uh, poppy iris syndrome uh, during, during the catch surgery. And you can refer back to the uh, work sessions in the Q&A platform. And regarding uh, questions about, uh, uh, is Dr. Ho available now to answer? Uh, is there any pearls in glaucoma assessment for those highly myopic eye who has done refractive surgery? Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Uh, Ho. Yes, can you hear me? Oh, I think that I think that uh, I would just uh, just add a thought too regarding this issue. And then, first of all, as I've mentioned, that uh, the problem of the central corneal thickness may have been over overused in the past regarding a as a surrogate of the total mechanical strength of the globe. So then, uh, so then, it, uh, so then, so then, now I would say I would say that if we if you want to uh, add, uh, assess the overall over susceptibility to glaucoma, I would not only use the CCT in, in, the, in particular for those patients who are having reflective surgery. I think that a, a more recent, um, a more comprehensive approach would be to use the opto, uh, uh, ocular response analyzer or the Pascal, uh, the Pascal, uh, uh, which may be a more, uh, more, preci uh, more precise reflection in the mechanical strength. And then second thing is that uh, there's always been a discussion about the, CC, uh, about the CCT after uh, they, they are always having sort of the so-called corrected intraocular pressure as for those eyes. I think that this is not really that. And then in fact, actually in the field of glaucoma, they're actually abandoning the idea of having a corrected intraocular pressure. So I think that uh, I think that for those patients, the real the, the the real thing is actually to detect for the defect and also to detect for the progression. And otherwise, if we uh, we were just based on the corneal thickness uh, and uh, and doing the predicting all these things just based on the corneal thickness, it's not going to help the patient. And actually, it may miss the progression of those patients. Thank you, Doctor Ho. Is there any uh, supplement from the speakers regarding the questions that has been listed in the Q&A platform? I think uh, so far, uh, some uh, delegates uh, would like to have more pictures or videos shown. I think we can, uh, if needed, we can contact individually by email to uh, our speakers. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any further questions from delegates? Hi, Professor Narata, nice to meet you. I, I, I saw you, nice to meet you. Thank you for welcome, organizing welcome. the wonderful uh, conference. Uh, welcome everybody to this uh, uh, International DOS meeting and thank you so much for your contributions, for your time and for your presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, that is, um, a delegate is asking about ultra wide field imaging. I think uh, Dr. Ho already answered in words about the, uh, the use of it in assessing glaucoma. The limited, still there has a limitation in experience on the use of these tools in assessing glaucoma. Dr. Ho, do you have anything to add? No, well, I, I, I just want to, uh, I just want to add, to add the word, uh, add the word of two. Personally, personally, we, uh, our, our center, the, the uh, our center does not have the ultra far, or, or wide view, uh, and then uh, but I think that uh, some something that we some some bearings that we need to have is that when we are interpreting, we are when interpreting for glaucoma progression, most of the most of the data is actually built on actually twenty four twenty four dash two. So then uh, all the uh, all the treatment protocols and all these uh, response and. Uh, uh, actually based on uh, 20, uh, 24-2. So uh, whether uh, if we are using other modalities to detect for the progression, whether they are general, uh, general, uh, generalizable is actually another question. So I think that uh, 
they may actually help as sub, uh, supplementary information. But uh, I think in order, if we, use, we want to generalize the findings into all the patients, you need to be very cautious. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ho. If there is no more questions, you mean, uh, if that, uh, Dr. Jadish, would you mind, uh, uh, can you elaborate? Uh, do you ask an ultra wide field for glaucoma or the ultra wide field for the assessments of the visual retinal diseases uh, in highly myopic eyes? Yes, I think Dr. Ho already explained the uh, for the perspective on the ultra wide field imaging. Yes. Okay, thank you very much for uh, all the speakers and the organizer. I would like to thank uh, uh, Professor Narata and also Professor uh, uh, Dakish for the. Uh, for the uh, invitations to our society and uh, speaking in the symposium. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much for finishing it in time. Uh, in the meanwhile, as we are concluding the session, uh, we shall be joining back in exactly two hours. Uh, Dr. Namrata, would you like to give uh, the closing remarks? No, no, it's perfectly all right. I think I have thanked the Hong Kong Society uh, of Thirmalji Hong Kong Society for uh, their presence here and their contributions. And we hope to have you again on another platform uh, in future. So I will be troubling you again. Huh? So uh, uh, please uh, do help us again in all our future scientific endeavors. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Namrata, would you agree? We would like to have a physical conference in India soon with all of these uh, esteemed faculty yeah, members. Yeah, in, in India. I'm sure we'll you know, maybe a year or maybe a couple of years will be there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, in the meanwhile, we shall log in back exactly at one o'clock Indian time. That's two hours from now. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Karan, holding slide. And I have already taken a